Okay, okay, welcome. It is 7 p.m. on the East Coast, about 4 p.m. on the West Coast. Uh, I am Christopher Hastings, executive producer of World Channel at WGBH in Boston. I'd like to welcome you to this special uh, virtual event for the history of white people in America. Um, we are uh, so excited to have you here today um, on this Indigenous Peoples Day. Uh, and we specifically uh, programmed this event to be on Indigenous Peoples Day because we thought it was a, a good way to sort of celebrate the day and to acknowledge um, um, acknowledge um, Indigenous people around the world and here in America. Um, I am so, so excited that we are here and could have a, a very robust conversation. Um, uh, this event is part of a collection of content that we are hosting at worldchannel.org as part of our Your Vote 2020 uh, collection of content leading into the election. Uh, we're talking about a lot of different subjects that are related uh, to this year's election, including race in America. Um, so we thought this would be a good, good way to do it. Uh, for those of you who have not seen this series, if you're just now being introduced to it, uh, we are really excited to bring it to you. Uh, if you like what you see, if you have comments about what you see, we encourage you to talk about it on social media using hashtag history of white people in America and hashtag your vote 2020 on social media. Um, I'm not going to be moderating tonight's event, uh, but I brought in a friend of mine who is an awesome journalist uh, here at WGBH in Boston and also at WBUR in Boston. Um, she is just sort of um, uh, multi-talented. Her name is Paris Austin, a uh, journalist who I think uh, can really guide you tonight. Uh, Paris, how are you doing? I'm doing well, Chris. How are you doing? I'm good. I'm good. I'm so good to have you here with us tonight. So you are driving this event. I am just here watching and 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 a, and a you know a viewer. Uh, it's your show. Take it. Will do. And thank you so much for that lovely introduction. And I will tell everyone who's with us tonight, you picked a really good event to attend tonight, wouldn't you say? <laughs> Between all of the tensions around Indigenous Peoples Day and Columbus Day and what that means, especially in the context of everything we're going through as a nation right now. Um, so kudos to you. Good job. So we're going to jump right into it. But first, I just wanted to do a couple introductory things and kind of explain, um, you know, more about what we're going to be doing tonight. And as Chris said, remember, you can follow along on social media and join the conversation by using the hashtags YourVote2020 and hashtag History of White People in America. We are also taking questions. Um, we'll have a conversation later in the evening and we'll be taking your questions, whether you're watching here um, or if you're watching online on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, feel free to send us your questions and we will be glad to include those in our conversation. So I am gonna start by asking a question. What color are you? And that may be the most important question in American history. When 60 Africans were taken to Jamestown, Virginia, aboard a pirate ship in 1619, they were not black, the English were not white, and the indigenous peoples were not red. Race as we know it had not yet been invented. Through musical animation, sorry, through musical animated shorts, the history of white people in America examines how skin color has come to define race in our country, and as we know, it has become one of the biggest definitions by which we all move through this nation. So I'm gonna run through a little bit of what we're gonna do tonight. So you have a good expectation. First, we're going to view episode one of the history of white people in America. And then as promised, you are going to get to meet the makers of this series. We're going to be in conversation with Pierce Freelon and I'll go ahead and give you a little preview. We're gonna have a special guest who we'll reveal later. We're also going to be speaking with John Halperin and both Pierce and John are creators of the history of white people in America. And we'll also hear from Cornelius Moore and Rhonda Taylor Bullock. And I'll tell you more about all of those people later on. And then we'll go into our conversation, including our Q and A. And afterwards we will have music selections from Nina Freelon, who is a vocalist, from pianist Alan Thompson and from vocalist Pierce Freelon. So let's jump right in and take a look at episode one. Hey, you. 
Caucasian. Hey, Blanco. Gringo. Pale face. I gotta tell you a secret. Gruni. Mzungu. This might come as a surprise, but... White people, listen to this. In America in the early 1600s, you didn't exist. You didn't exist? I hate to break it to you like this. Listen to what your history books missed. What would be made white were completely unrelated, under-melanated people. Frankenstein. Collaged by an optical illusion. The ultimate mirage called race. A social construction like Santa Claus. Back in the day, y'all either English or Scott. Irish Catholic or Protestant, land owning or not. But you can't have white without black in America. Back before we was Captain America, black wasn't a race. Africans came from different nations, like in Dongo, where Queen Nzinga reigned. Indigenous were the same. Pohatan, Doeg, regardless of tribe, melanin didn't determine fate. Skin color didn't make a difference, no matter what hue your flesh was tinted in. Cause your complexion wasn't kinship, and pigment was insignificant. It didn't prevent you from certain privileges. This is the story of how skin became color. Color became race, and race became power. The creation of the Caucasian, white Aryan. It's the story of how white became American. The census says your race is white, you don't believe the hype. 1650. Jamestown. Meet William Berkeley, appointed by King Charles II of England to govern colonial Virginia. He rules with an iron hand and enriches a small cadre of English landowners. They grow tobacco. The sweet leaf is gold. America's first road to riches. Crop. They kidnap and capture men Engaged in human trafficking and trap the African And if they can't steal the labor then they use lies as lures Of false promises as tools to recruit all the poor from Bristol to Liverpool Little did they know that they were in for something cruel Jamestown was their destination When Berkeley looks at his servants, what does he see? Color, of course, but color doesn't mean much to a man of means. They're heathens. Waste. Dirty, diseased, lazy animals. I would sooner call my hound brother than a servant of any shade. Under God and by law, he has the right to whip, maim, starve, buy, or sell them at his pleasure. But he fears them. He should. The rich are few and the poor are many. It's almost impossible to imagine now, but the poor see themselves as one. They have a common bond and a common enemy. Together. 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 The Africans and English were together. They labored and lived, prayed and made a life together. Stole, escaped, hold and wait together. They got lashed and went to jail together. Worked hard and catch hell together. It wasn't criminal for them to love together. Got married and had kids together. The colony was filled with different shades together. Mahogany, tan, olive, and beige together. Molasses, dark, chocolatey flavors together. Peach, bronze, amber, and brown. But very soon, life would change up in Jamestown. There's no lifetime slavery yet. The indentured Europeans and Africans can still buy their freedom. Released from bondage, they'd set out in search of land. For these new frontiersmen, freedom is a rotten promise. The rich own all the good soil, and the indigenous tribes desperately grasp for the rest, fighting for every acre they have left. The frontiersmen seethe with each new tax, each broken promise, each death, each rich man that grows richer, each poor man that grows poor, until they can't take it anymore. 1676, time to take matters into their own hands. They cast one Nathaniel Bacon as leader, the son of an aristocrat who came to the frontier after squandering his inheritance. 
Under Bacon, they band together to take land from the tribes and power from Berkeley. Together. Get your guns, get your knives, first target is the tribes, kill the men, women, and the children. Hundred men turn into a thousand. A posse turned gorilla army is astounding. And don't go English, Angolan, Irish. Fought together, together to abolish all the tyrants and the snakes. Ready to mount the heads on stakes. Enough of these rich men, of these false men, corrupt men. Light the torches and set Jamestown ablaze. Let it burn, let it burn. Jamestown put the ashes in the urn. A hundred years before the revolution. Africans and Europeans were in union. Let it burn. Let it burn. The British never wanted us to earn. So bring the fire to the upper classes. We can make a better future from the ashes. Berkeley watches Jamestown burn, and he burns with vengeance. The waste must be cleansed from God's green earth. Behind a British gunship, retribution. Berkeley hangs 20 and scatters the rest into the wilderness. The rich of Jamestown know it could have been their own necks hanging from the end of a poor man's noose. To survive as rich men, as powerful men, they vow never to let the poor rise up again as one. But how? What scheme? What deception. In 1681, white will appear in a legal document for the first time in history when Virginia bans Africans from marrying whites. One law of dozens creating and separating the races. Blacks across the colonies will be enslaved for life, no longer treated as human, but as property. Poor whites were handed the whip. The rich exploited their ignorance. They traded rebellious plots for managing slave auction blocks and any chance for both of their freedom was lost. It doesn't happen overnight, but the rich divided people by phenotype. Melanin, skin color, you dark, you light. Your life or death could be determined by the question, are you white? Well, are you white? Go ahead. Take a look in the mirror. Ask yourself, am I white? We are no longer allowed to marry. We are no longer allowed to start a family. We, we are, are no, no longer, longer allowed. Can we say aloud? Should we stay inside? That we have a child? Can we stay alive? We're not coming out. Why are we vilified? Let's go underground. We are no longer allowed. I'm ready. All righty. Now, wasn't that powerful? Mm -hmm. um, and that was, it was a great intro into all the other episodes. Um, and you can catch the first three episodes on worldchannel.org. Or if you want to re-watch or share that episode that we just watched, you can do that all on worldchannel.org. Um, and you can keep up with the other episodes to come. But <laughs> right now, we're going to talk about what we have in front of us now. And to do that with us, I'm going to introduce our panelists. First up, we have Pierre Srilan, who is an Emmy Award-winning producer, an arts activist, a professor of Black Studies, and a millennial politician. In 2017, Pierce ran for mayor of his hometown, Durham, North Carolina, which is not that far from my hometown of Greensboro. In Durham, Pierce founded a digital marker space, makerspace called Black Space. He is the co-founder of the Beat Making Lab an Emmy Award-winning PBS web series, which has taken him from the Democratic Republic of the Congo to making beats with environmentalist Jane Goodall. He is the leader of a jazz and hip-hop band called The Beast. 
Pierce earned a BA in African and African American Studies at UNC Chapel Hill, which is also on my alma mater. And he also earned an MA in Pan-African Studies at Syracuse, Syracuse University. He has taught music, political science, and African American Studies at both UNC Chapel Hill and North Carolina Central University. Pierce lives in Durham with his wife and their two children. Pierce, thanks for being with us. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Yes, and Pierce, I understand you have a special guest joining you as well. I do have a special guest. Dun dun dun. Dun 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 dun. dun. Come on. Who is the this, <laughs> this is my mother, hey. six six time Grammy nominated jazz vocalist and producer of Pierce Dean and Maya Freeland. Yes, I'm your producer. You are, man. You are my producer. <laughs> so yeah, my mom's here. Awesome. Well, we're so you. glad to have you, Lena. Mm -hmm. Thank you for being with us. As Thank well. you. And we also have with us John Halperin, who is an Emmy award-winning director, writer, and producer. He has produced, directed, and written and overseen documentaries for Amazon, PBS, National Geographic, Time, and ITBS, TED, Tech TV, Discovery. I mean, the rap sheet is long, y'all. And also for digital and theatrical distribution. In 2012, John founded Room 608 with Mark Manucci, a new media and documentary production company based in New York. John and Halperin and Manucci also most recently were executive producers of the Amazon series Lore, a hybrid fiction documentary series for Propagate Content and Valhalla Entertainment, as well as the HHMI series I Contain Multitudes for PBS Digital. He won an Emmy for Best Science and Technology Film in 2017 for A Year in Space and for Best Investigative Documentary in 2009 for Guerrilla Murders. John, thanks so much for being here. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Absolutely. And we have Cornelius Moore, who's the co-director of California Newsreel, the 52-year-old social issue film distribution and production company, and he has been a staff member since 1981. He currently heads California Newsreel's African American Perspectives collection, which is focused on films around African American life and history. Among California Newsreel's productions are the widely respected and utilized series Race, The Power of an Illusion and Unnatural Causes. Is Inequality Making Us Sick? Cornelius has served on funding panels and as a judge for film festivals in the US and internationally. He is also an independent film curator, most regularly for the Museum of the African Diaspora, specializing in films from the Black world. Cornelius, thank you for being here. Thank you very much, Paris. It's a pleasure to be here. Absolutely. And last, but certainly, certainly not least, we have another queen on this panel, Dr. Rhonda Taylor Bullock, who earned, who earned her doctorate at UNC Chapel Hill in the Policy, Leadership, and School Improvement Program. Her research interests are critical race theory, whiteness studies, white children's racial identity construction, and anti-racism. Dr. Taylor Bullock is the co-founder and lead curator of We Are, which stands for Working to Extend Anti-Racist Education. As a nonprofit, We Are works to equip children, families, and educators with the knowledge and skills necessary to understand the complexity of racism. We Are uses a three-pronged approach to dismantle systemic racism in education and beyond by offering summer camps for children in rising first through fifth grade, workshops for families, and professional development for educators. Rhonda, thanks so much for being with us. Thank you so much for having me. Pleasure to be here. So let's jump right in and first talk about this first episode that we've watched, but also the series as a whole. And so Pierce, John, you know, feel free to kind of piggyback off of each other when I ask you this first question. But I do want to know what drove you to create this series? John? No, go ahead, Pierce. <laughs> okay. All right. I'll, I'll kick it off. Um, well, Paris, if, if I may, would, would you allow me to kick things off with a, with a land acknowledgement? I just want to, um, I just want to acknowledge that right now we're in Durham, North Carolina which is where I was born and raised. This is the uh, traditional territory of the Saponi band of the Okanichi tribe. tribe. And um, you know, their legacies and, and birthright is, was with us as we were crafting this project. And in fact, on episode two of History of White People in America, which you saw a preview of at the end of the episode, 
the voices of one of those characters is a is a is a black woman who has roots in the Okanichi Saponi tribe, uh, Yoni Jeffrey. So I wanted to lift her up Absolutely. and just yeah, I mean it's Indigenous Peoples Day and mm -hmm. and you know that that story it's a it's a it's a harrowing story from the indigenous perspective, you know because there was this battle being waged between the British and and the African folks and and other poor Europeans and and kind of caught in the crosshairs of that conflict were the were the uh, indigenous folks who are also you know uh, uh, struggling to to survive in this in this new world and so uh, well sorry new world by western standards but land that they had occupied for for hundreds of thousands of years so i just wanted to i wanted to begin there and um, you know for me i think uh, history of white people in america is a project that really sp uh, uh, speaks to the West African concept of Sankofa. Sankofa means you, you need to look back in order to move forward. It's a, it's a Ghanaian from Ghana word that means go back and fetch it. And so if we want to understand where we are now, you know, in a, in a, in a world where, where white nationalism is on the rise, where the Proud Boys and Trump is up here trying to delete curriculums like Dr. Rhonda is, is, is working on, like, we have to understand the history of race to understand really where we got here, where we're at. And that's really where John was when, when, when we first came together in about, what was that, 2016, 2015? You know, it, it may have been right before a, a certain presidential election. <laughs> right, right. And so, you know, at that time, my father, uh, right now, you know, we're in the house of uh, my dad's house, my mom and dad. My dad, Phil Freelon, was the architect of the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture. So right around when you called, John, we were a couple months from the opening of that historic museum. We were at the end of Obama's second term you know, looking forward to the future. And then bam, you know, we all know what happened in November of 2016. And this project, which was already in the works beforehand, had this whole new relevancy as, as these aspects of white supremacy that have been entrenched in our country began to flare up in these very visceral ways. And so the need to understand our history and our roots in that moment you know, has only become more relevant and more pressing, you know, leading up to this summer with the murder of George Floyd and, you know, and, and, the, and, the, ch and the calls for change and for accountability in our criminal justice system and around white supremacy and, and systemic racism in general. So, you know, it, it's a real privilege to have been working on this project for five, going on four or five years. Um, but, you know, the, Cornelius Moore, like, you know, the, the, the other folks who are on this panel, Rhonda Taylor Bullock, you know, they've been doing this work around anti-racism, around, you know, curriculums to get us hit to our history for, for a long time. And I think what, what one of the things that History of White People in America offers is, is animated hip hop storytelling as a, as a particular module to tell this story, right? Cornelius is not, it's not a doc, <laughs> you know, right? Rhonda, right. like it's not, it's not a, a traditional curriculum, it's hip hop and it's animation. So it, it's, it's, it's somewhere between, a, a, you know, a, a, a schoolhouse rock, you know, and a rock <laughs> him version of this history, which is I think what, what gives us the added nuance um, Rhonda, I saw you on mute. I know you want to speak, sis. I know you were supposed to come in later, but I want to invite you in now. Can we? <laughs> now, I was trying to capture, you know, that call and response of the audience, responding to what you were preaching. <laughs> so I want to make sure you felt it. <laughs> you better tap into your roots, that call and response. I see you. <laughs> but, I mean, I'm, I'm just echoing and nodding my head to all the things that you're saying, Pierce. I mean, such a time as this that the history of white people it, with this hip hop piece was written um, also in a way because it's accessible to young people. And mm -hmm. so for us as an organization, like our target audience in the children perspective um, is elementary age kids. And so um, through, our, through our summer camps, which we're hoping to do next summer, we had a council postpone this summer, we will be engaging 
the students in watching the history of white people and looking at the series and using that as an educative tool that catches their attention. It's the visuals, it's the audio, it's the sound, um, and it's the history um, that they need. And so it's just powerful and I'm just happy um, to be along for this ride. Yeah, and I want and and Cornelius. I don't know if you wanted. I mean, I know that as Pierce mentioned, so much of the work that you and that Rhonda have done is really, you know, the basis for a lot of the the type of work that we see, like what Pierce and John has introduced to us. And so I'm wondering, from your perspective, Cornelius, having done something that has been a true blueprint for many people, a true educational tool, how are you reacting to seeing something that gets at that history in a different way? Well. Um... The Race Power Illusion was that my colleague, uh, Larry Edelman was the executive producer and co-producer with Jane Chang. So I'm gonna, gonna give them acknowledgement. But I found out about this, this series from one of the people who produced the second episode of Race to Power and Illusion, Tracy Heather Strain, who's based in the Boston area. And I saw it and I shared it with my colleague, Larry Edelman, and we were both blown away. We thought how, you know, how different, I mean, we certainly thought it, it's a, it's a, um, it's a companion, it's uh, comradely, and that it, it um, was going to, hopefully it was going to reach another demographic, another audience, maybe another generation, because the form um, is very accessible, as people have mentioned, and, and exciting and, and energizing, and, 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 and um, taps into the, the, the using music and, and, and um, animation, and, and certainly in a different way. That Pierce was talking about is that it is um, narrative, and and um, you know we, often these things are not dealt with in these in this form, and it's so it was exciting that the idea that it could reach another another um, another audience, and and also and in, in, it, it integrates things that um, I think there was some difficulty in 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 getting some of those subjects into. Race the power of illusion and, de and dealt with it in a very economic way. So we're very excited about it. Certainly. And we, we've already have some questions that are flowing in. So everyone watching, definitely please continue to send them there. We have some great questions coming in. And, and for Pierce and John, um, Lee, who is with us, who's joining us this evening, wants to kind of pull back the curtain and let us into this creative process mm -hmm. and talk about how we've arrived at this very interesting, very different storytelling method, right? And so Leah's asking, how did you storyboard this short? And what, how did you decide what to focus on? Who came up with these powerful graphics and art? And I also wanna know, um, I wanna tack on to Lee's question and ask why did you decide this medium? How did you know that it would be so powerful? I know it's like four different questions. So. <laughs> well, we, should, we should shout out to, um... Drew Takahashi and Ed Bell, who are the animators. Mm -hmm. um, and I think what's unique about this project is that there are actually six directors. It really is a collaboration of, of, of Pierce and Aaron Keane, who I should say seven, because Nina and with the music, the, the three <laughs> of them, um, Clementine, um, Brand, and myself, sort of uh, writing, producing parts of it, and then Ed, Ed Bell, and Drew Takahashi, who did the art. And it was a series of conversations and uh, mostly on the phone um, where we would talk for hours about what we wanted to focus on and how to tell it. And it was this dialogue for the first episode over a year mm -hmm. of speaking and arguing and fighting and disagreeing. And I would say a word and Pierce would get pissed at me because I said a word that he didn't like and he was right and I learned something and you know it, and that all kind of this creative process ended up what you saw tonight and um, it's a, I, I've never worked on a creative process like this where it was six people six equals films very hierarchical and this was not that way this was really six artists trying to wrestle with a really complicated issue to make something that we felt needed to be heard. Mm -hmm. And Nina, since we have you, I mean, part of that is what we're hearing, right? And I know that I'm feeling that that was a collaborative relation really between you and Pierce on the musical side. And so what, what goes into making, to telling that story musically? 
Well, I mean, I, I'm, a, I'm a jazz artist. I'm an improvisational human being. Mm -hmm. And I think it's interesting to note whenever we grapple with um, words, we're trying to find words to, to tell a story, that should tell you something. It's complicated and it requires our attention because words haven't been created and art hasn't been created in the, in the same way it has around other things that we think we know. I was really honored to have my son ask me to participate. Once I saw what they were working on, I was like, oh, y'all needed a black woman's voice up in here. <laughs> And I was so happy to oblige and so happy to be listened to because I think a lot of what we are uncovering here is people's um, kind of disappearing act. We have a disappearing act on the history, mm -hmm. you know? So um, to tell truths that have not been told before is so powerful. And the refinement of those truths, because sometimes we tell half the story, mm -hmm. Sometimes we tell the only part of the story that we know, and sometimes we're blinded by who we are and what our life experience has been, and we just can't see around the corner. So having six other people with six different life experience who respected one another, didn't have to agree, but respected one another enough to listen. And you know, I think that's, that's the magic that we need everywhere. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Absolutely. And Nina, you, you offer a really great segue into, I want to pull together two viewer questions because you're talking about, right? Like how these histories are told, what parts we tell or don't tell what we're missing out on. And so Faye, who's watching wants to know, she's saying there seems to be a conversation between this video series and the New York times 1619 project. And she's wondering, or or Faith, or they, I should say, as Faye is wondering if there's a connection in the development of those storytelling projects. And I wanna pair that with a question from Felicia who's watching. And Felicia wants to know what is the core falsehood or myth that the history of white people is trying to teach Americans, be they white, black, mm, Latinx, um, So thinking about those <laughs> two questions together, Two big ones, but anyone can feel free to jump in. Well, well I'll just say that the, the, the 1619 Project, which we, uh, you know, have huge admiration for and, and how they've moved the civic conversation is incredible. But but the projects were sort of developed um, without the others knowing that they existed. So that's that's one thing. And I think we should all answer the second question. But I'll just say that for me, it's it's since the since 1619, basically, what I learned is that rich people have been trying to divide poor people by skin color. And that's, that we see it now, and it's gone back since the start. And to me, that, that's the thing that I learned, that it, yeah. it, it's, been, it's been about social control from the start. And um, some people have obviously suffered far more than others, but that, that, that's part of the American story that has not been told. Yeah, I, I just wanna, building on what John was saying, and then I wanna throw this to Dr. Rhonda Taylor Bullock, because I know this is, that's like an alley-oop. You just threw her an alley-oop. She gonna <laughs> flush it in a second. But I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna add a little context, and it's, it's a lyric, actually. Uh, I think it's the line in the, in the last act, uh, after Bacon's Rebellion, mm. it's, uh, you know, poor whites were handed the whip. The rich exploited their ignorance. They traded rebellious plots for managing slave auction blocks and any chance for both of their freedom was lost. Like, let's not lose sight of the fact that poor whites and poor black folks were both oppressed and our collective unity, solidarity, potential, and liberation yeah. was lost in the creation of whiteness. And, 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 uh, and that is the saddest story yeah. <laughs> in the I, book. I, I would also like to just say that when something is a lie, just like a lie, you need way more words than if it's a truth. 
because if it's a truth, you feel it, it's a stream of energy. So if race is a lie at its very core, you got to talk, 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 and back talk to make it makes, really, to make, make it make sense. Mm -hmm. You know, even the youngest child understands that it's a lie yeah, at no, some what? point. Yeah. What? Yeah, what? yeah. You, te you teach the and Montgomery, you, Montgomery you, bus boy cops and they're like, what book? What? what? Because they were, what was the reason? Yeah. Can I just say, and even the problematic in the first episode we're talking about with Bacon's Rebellion, where um, there's even that where people are uniting even to talk about taking Native American land, that you didn't shy away from that. I mean, you, rather than it, it's not celebrating that that what you know what was going to happen, but it was acknowledging that that was part of the that's part of the situation, and that's something that to be discussed. And I I think. Um, in discussions with y'all that you're gonna uh, sort of integrate or have more about Native American um, history in, in this in this series. Mm -hmm. totally. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're planning to tell the American Revolution entirely from the point of view of indigenous people, which mm -hmm. we don't think has been done in, well, especially not in hip hop, but mm -hmm. done at all. Yeah, and I just wanted to add that, like, from the, the children's perspective, um, going back to the free lines, um, most kids, now not all, they're not innocent, right? But a lot of kids don't rationalize racism away in the way that adults will, right? And so children will say, they do look at it as who would do such a thing? Who would, who would separate people? Who would burn someone's home? Who would say that I can't drink out of this water fountain the same as my classmate? And it doesn't make sense to them. But for us as adults, we've been desensitized to it a little bit. And so it's not as uh, horrific for some of us as it is when we're, so in our, with our program with We Are, um, and it's not just me, I'm here on behalf of our whole organization, an amazing board. We do an anti-racism summer camp uh, with kids in rising first through fifth grade. And we use a literacy-based approach to help kids think about race, racism, skin color, whiteness in very concrete ways. And so we're always using text to do that, text such as videos, right? And like, again, I cannot wait to show them this, but one of the things that, that the video makes visible is that you're learning history and we're naming and intentionally naming that you're learning about whiteness. Because some of this history has been taught, but it was taught as if it was neutral, race neutral. Mm -hmm. These are just the things that happened. But mm -hmm. what Pierce and his team has done is made it, it is very hard for you to watch this and not talk about whiteness. Mm -hmm. It is very hard for you to watch this and not talk about the construction of race. And so they've made that very visible that in these different acts that were documented, whiteness was being formed. Mm. The wages of whiteness, which um, Pierce was talking about, that even the poor folks, they may not have had a penny in their pocket, but whiteness was their currency. Mm -hmm. And so we haven't had access to language to that previously, right? Well, in, in, the, in the educational sense, like we, many of us who study it, <laughs> we had that access, but now this is gonna become a part of um, kids uh, and adults too, because it's not, I wouldn't say it's just for, for children, it's just accessible. Right, but adults will be watching this and learning in ways that they hadn't learned either. And so that's what I like about how the film is intentional or the, doc the series is intentional and um, it makes, you have to talk about whiteness. You cannot walk away from that history and not talk about how race is constructed. Can, can, I, can I bounce off that for a second? Absolutely, please. Okay, okay. So I, I just very briefly wanna say, and John, feel free to chime in, that, and that has not been without struggle. Mm -hmm. right, right, John? Like, oh yeah. People have yeah. been trying to get us to change the name. You know, the name is controversial. The Even the end of episode one, are you white? Are mm -hmm. you white? We must ask that 18 times. Are you white? You know, I'm getting up in the camera. Like, are you white? It's a real question we want people to ask. And that's intentional because white supremacy is a structure. It is a systematic thing that has integrated so many aspects of our culture and society. Mm -hmm. One of the things though, and I'll just toss this out here that that's really interesting to me in putting this episode together, maybe you could talk on this too, uh, Mr. Moore, um, is about how they chose to codify it into law was through marriage. 
Mm-hmm. It was marriage. They didn't start with the slave code. You can't own land. You can't do this. You can't do that. That all came later. The first law was the anti miscegenation law. We don't even want y'all to copulate, you know, to build a family. That family unit is a is a dangerous yes. place. But then complicated it by allowing, you know, people to own people, which meant you could do whatever you wanted to do. It's so it's so complicated and so so screwed up that um, it's the dress you put on. And the less you acknowledge and understand, the more privilege you, um, you enjoy. Um, we, we, we have to stop drinking all the Kool-Aid and we need to start having conversations um, that are curious, where we are curious about how did we get here? How indeed did we get here? I have black friends, I have white friends. Hmm. I'm not a racist, you know? Um, it, it's, it's, it's worth the inquiry, hmm. it's necessary. This inquiry is so necessary and the entire planet hinges hmm. on our ability to ask these potent questions. So in, in uh, Race, the Power of an Illusion, I was looking um, at the second episode and the late historian James Horton was talking about how if, if um, and I'm sort of quoting, if America had looked at the world and said that, um, that people are held in bondage, enslaved because, you know, America wanted their labor and, and had the power to do it. But r- rather the message was there's something wrong with these people Mm-hmm. And that, and and doing and doing that means that when slavery was over, that the rationalization for slavery continues. It persists, and so and that's and some of the things I think you're you're laying the groundwork to say these are not individual decisions, these are not personalities, these are institutionalized um, ways of you know taking power from people or economically dominating, exploiting people. So and that's I mean I think that's really sort of key to what you're what you're doing here, so that people know. That it's not like it's not it's not interpersonal relationships, the systems and structure. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the, the first laws were Africans couldn't marry English, Africans couldn't own guns. Mm-hmm. Right? Think about that. Yep. Mm-hmm. Think about and then Africans couldn't sell livestock that they that that they owned. Mm-hmm. So those were the first three laws. Yep. And I and I appreciate you naming that, that these laws, because sometimes when you talk about systemic racism and structural racism, people are very quick to say there is no systemic racism. Mm-hmm. Talk about what's going on right now in politics, uh, politicians, the president saying there is no systemic racism, but even that word for some folks confuses them. When you bring it back to work, systemic racism is rooted in laws and policies. Mm-hmm. Policy. So what, no, you can't deny systemic racism when you go and pull out the laws that are documented through history, the dates and the thing. Now, when we're talking about systemic and structural racism, we're talking about putting these five policies together. Now you have a system. Right. Right. And sometimes you have to break it down for the, for the willfully ignorant who are, who are too- <laughs> <laughs> and with, with, you know, is is no, this is what we're talking about y'all. There are, you cannot deny that there were not laws and policies that were mm-hmm implemented to create and, and support and uphold white supremacy. Right. Mm-hmm. And and that's one thing I like about the series is that we provide receipts, mm-hmm. like real receipts. Yeah. You know, look at the, especially episode two, at the end of episode two, they talk about how the, at the end of it, they talk about how the slave codes kind of spread throughout the colonies and throughout the country. And seeing that visually represented was really powerful for me. Mm-hmm. Again, even knowing the history we show a, a we superimpose the map of the United yes, States of America yes. with the laws as they came into you know into fruition, and it started in the South and it spread like COVID, <laughs> you know, across the country, uh, and that's the that's the virus that we're still dealing with the implications of. I mean, that, listen, I mean, the ninth law ever passed by Congress, so the first Congress, the ninth law ever in the history of the United States, right, was that you had to be white and they use that word white to become a nationalized citizen mm-hmm. right these are this these, yes this was people made decisions mm-hmm. right this was an active thing 
This wasn't in the water. This, this were people deciding to enact these laws. Into yeah. I, I, have a, I have a question about the entry, entry point because I did maybe did the mistake of scrolling down and looking at some of the comments. You know, people watch and they, you know, it's like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, they, it's they always it. read the comments, but sometimes you like have to. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but it's like, because the, the first, you know, the first sounds are epithets, of, you know, and racial epithets and name calling and everything. And, and there are people who are like, I mean, I, I know what you were doing, but I, I wanted to hear your, your, um, the conversation that went on about beginning that way and what you thought the reaction would be from people or what you yeah, hope would if be. I could if I could add to that Cornelius because it is it is Indigenous Peoples Day and there's also this conversation about Columbus Day and and I just remember that that New York Times article that came out last last Columbus Day about how Italians became white and it's kind of centered in what John is talking about and what Cornelius is talking about yeah, so um, I can speak on that a little bit. Uh, for me, you know, a couple of those words might be unfamiliar with folks. Obruni, Muzungu, you know, when I first went to Ghana uh, and I was called Obruni, I said, oh, what's that? Is that like African-American? They said, no, that means white man, you know, Ooh. because the perception of, it literally means foreigner, but it's synonymous with white man, mm. you know. And same for uh, my first times in, in Kenya and in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, Muzungu. You know, these are words and terms. And every culture, you know, white supremacy is global. <laughs> it's international. And every culture has a word, gringo, every has a word that they use to describe white people. And so coming, beginning the episode with this cacophonous, international to me it was rooted in in uh, not just pan-african I, I was a pan-african studies scholar and so i very and you know i know a lot about the particular relationship between white supremacy and the pan-african diaspora you know the black world particularly the black atlantic but uh you know to me it was about the ways in which white supremacy has this global impact and, and naming that from the perspective of, of in different languages. What is white in your language? And so and what's interesting too, you know, is the question of derogatory. What, what, what does that even mean in this context? And that goes back to what Dr. Rhonda Taylor Bullock was saying about racism is not bigotry, it's systemic. These are systems, you know? And so uh, uh, I anticipated with that intro thinking people, mm. people think connecting it to, to racism and, and seeing that as an opportunity to, to say, well, actually there's a big difference between a term and a system, mm. you know, and, and, and obviously we associate terms, especially the N word, for example, with racism as it relates to and is intrinsically connected with systemic racism. Uh, we also want to make sure that we distinguish those those two things. Mm -hmm. But essentially, at, at the, the most basic answer to your question, Brother Cornelius, is these are just words that people use to describe white folks. It's basically how you say white, mm -hmm. you know, colloquially, blanco, you know, gringo, but even, but even, Pierce, as you say white folks, that offends some people because <laughs> they don't want to be experience on block right seen you know they don't want to be seen as one thing whiteness supposed to be invisible you know so they want to be you know joe the, the the guy the guy joe you know mary the lady mary not white folks yeah. i and, i loved it because it, it just makes like this is how it feels yeah well, you know it, it was just a provoc provocative way to start this you want to be you want to be white and here's an African-American singer, right? Who's gonna call you white and let's see how it feels. Right, and, and, and just, I, I don't wanna over talk because uh, uh, I know I'm taking up, I tend to take up space sometimes. <laughs> I just wanna acknowledge that. Uh, but John, uh, you, you nailed something important that I just wanna bump a little bit, which is, you know, whiteness often goes unnamed. It goes unnamed, and that's part of its power. 
that's part of what allows people who carry the privilege of whiteness to be like, oh, I didn't know that black people, I didn't know, you know, it's, it's couched in the invisibleness of whiteness. So naming it is, is an emancipatory, radical and provocative it is. gesture. There's also the ease of your being able to say within your whiteness that I'm me, you know, I'm just me. I'm not white folks, I'm me. But when we, we use the N word or, or other derogatory terms for, for black and brown people, they are a block of folks with all of the, um, all of the energy around who you think those people are. Mm. And um, to have permission to be, you know, there isn't one aesthetic that applies to all people who look like me. I am also me right. who likes, you know, a variety of things, including classical music and watermelon. Thank you very much. Water, I love watermelon. It. Watermelon. So, 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 and those of us who are on the stinging end of, of those kinds of ideas and, 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 and stereotypes, and stereotypes um, we know in our hearts that, that there is an untruth there. It, it, I, I don't know, I just, it's hard to talk about and it's hard to talk about for a reason. Well, yeah. Go ahead, go ahead. I was just gonna say for white people to distance themselves from whiteness is to also wash their hands. Mm. I'm not white, so that what, that what white folks did, you can't put that on me, right? I'm just me, I'm not responsible. Right? Mm. I want the benefits, but I don't want none of the messiness or the blame or the shame, right? right. Or okay. the shame. That's what part of that is, like trying to wash your hands of having any type of a historical connection of being the beneficiaries of, of you know, what that, um, of, of a racistly violent history. It's summed up, there's a sign, big sign down the street from me and it's giant from someone's house and it says, end racism, all lives matter. And that to me sums up <laughs> exactly what you're saying. Yeah. It's, it may be the most clueless sign in all of, <laughs> all of New York right now. Oh, I'm wondering to that point, John, do you all think that because of how we have categorized race in this country, how we have, have made it such a thing are we now at the point where we have we have to be naming it? Like that is the only way that we can begin to acknowledge each other fully is to name black, white, and really talk about or, or brown or or Asian American, et cetera, and really fully acknowledge that history. Well, I, I think that uh, it's about time we tell the truth, and, and it's really about that. You know, I, I, earlier when mom was talking, I was thinking about Polly Murray, who is another Durham legend icon. Mm -hmm. She talked about Jane Crow. She coined the term Jane Crow to talk about the intersection of patriarchy and white supremacy. We need to name the patriarchy so we can smash the patriarchy. We need to name the white supremacy so we can smash it. We need to name indigenous people's day you know, on Columbus Day. We didn't pick next week to do Indigenous Peoples Day. That's right. We're naming Indigenous Peoples Day on Columbus Day because we need to smash Columbus Day <laughs> and, and, and the res not the residues, just residue implies something just left over. Left over. No, <laughs> the, the, the Columbus legacy of colonialism and violent, I like um, Rhonda Taylor Bullock said, violent, the violence of white supremacy is embodied so fully in Christopher Columbus that we must name Indigenous Peoples Day on top of Columbus Day. You know what I mean? So, so I think that that truth telling process is unnerving to the status quo, but that's what makes the creative medium. And, and, and again, uh, going back to what Brother Cornelius said about, you know, about the documentary medium, very important medium, but we're artists and, and, and it took some creative thinking to get us in this mess to think about what can we create. You remember, John, at the end of episode one, what, what does Berkeley say? He says, what deception? 
what what tool what can tool? we use they had to think and they came up with a excuse my friend i won't even cuss don't do it okay i just won't cuss they came up with a creative i o idea yeah in race it was creative like that's different i'm just gonna say these poor people ain't the same and but you irish and scottish y'all can be together but y'all people over there y'all can't join like that's creative and guess what it's gonna take creative energy and creative empathy and creative power to be able to unravel, unravel yes. this mess that we found ourselves in so i think having artists involved in the conversation is imperative absolutely imperative because it, it was it was it, it's like evil genius you know the, <laughs> the creative energy that that put us where we are. Yeah, and also vote. <laughs> so, <laughs> please, uh, vote. Please, vote. I mean, this is about laws. We're talking about laws. This came about laws. Let's make some new laws. Let's, mm -hmm. let's make some new laws. And to add to this thought about how we, we're talking about this in modern day times, um, we have a question from a viewer um, who is wondering, you know, if someone could talk a little bit about how or why modern day phrases like people of color is socially ac acceptable, yet we don't include white people in that, or, or there's not necessarily, I guess, I don't know if I want to say equivalent, but that term white people is, is, all, is over there, <laughs> if that makes sense. Well, I, I, I don't know if I can speak for everybody, but um, I have a problem with people of color, honestly, mm -hmm. because it's not, you know, it's not really telling who I am. I am a woman of color, of course, but that leaves, you know, everybody is somebody of color. So let's be curious about why and how we make that division. Um, everybody's colored unless you invisible, the invisible man or the invisible woman. So why is that an easy place to go? That's worth some inquiry, people. That's worth some inquiry. And before you claim something holy as your identity, understand what does the child whose mother is white and whose father is black, do they have choice here? And all of us are descended from that, from that lovely woman in South Africa. <laughs> Everybody's so. grandmother's black, if you really want to tell the truth. So I'm just, I'm just saying, let's, let's throw all of these terms into a crucible and, and see how that dress fits. You know, see how it feels. Let's just be curious. Don't just accept it as truth. I mean, I don't know, maybe you have a different... You know, I think the most, the person who studied this the most is, is Dr. Rhonda Taylor Bullock. I would love to hear your opinion on this particular question. No, I mean, I think, um, you know, Mrs. Freela makes uh, some good points. Some, some people take issue with people of color because you, um, it, sometimes it erases black people because sometimes it's you, sometimes people use people of color when they really mean black. And so um, it's important. I, I really like how I've seen the language that black and indigenous people of color. So like mm -hmm. you can still talk about, you know, uh, us more melanated folks, but you name specifically black and indigenous as part of that by separating it out. Um, because sometimes people use this in a way when really, when they're talking about marginalized communities, but they're really just talking about black folks. And so you're, you're, it's just um, in some ways that it melts us all together in ways that aren't helpful in ways that makes the black struggle um, invisible. So, um, you know, I, I can see in some instances where it works, but in some instances, like when we're talking about black folks, we need to say black folks and be in the <laughs> And of course, now there's the term black and, and indigenous people of color. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, it's, it's, it's getting expanded. I mean, I think it's not, this is not the same, but I think similarly to where we have seen with the LGBTQ movement, we have now it's LGBTQIA and we have expanded and really made it so that people can claim the identities that are truest to them. And, and Paris, can I just say briefly too, you know, black 
is also a term that came from a political movement. It was the black power movement gave us, they gifted us black. And I'm so glad to receive it because what a gift from yeah, Amiri and Baraka so and Nikki yeah. Giovanni and, Absolutely. you know. And, and it was a reclamation era. of sorts as well. Right. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Right. I mean, and Brother Cornelius, you remember that era, right? I mean, I'm assuming that you were around back then. <laughs> you know, black don't crack, so you look very, yeah. you could be 40-something, I don't know, but. <laughs> it's, it's, I'm 65. Okay, so, uh, 65. So, so no, I mean, no, no, black was, yeah, black was, you know, not a, a term. It, it took something for us to embrace black because that was an insult. So, but it's also, now it's also I I actually I use black instead of this African American because I think it's more it's inclusive and it's international. So yes, that's that's my t take on it. Okay, thank you. Okay, my mother, <laughs> my mother who's in that same age group always reminds me. She'll just randomly say to me, "Ngawa, black power." She just likes to remind me. And I'm <laughs> grateful for that. <laughs> Bless your elders, parents. <laughs> yes, absolutely, absolutely, all of them, all of them. Um, so I guess to sort of to sort of kind of wrap here. I mean, there's so so much that we can continue to talk about. But the great thing is that this series is not the end. It is a beginning. It is a jumping off point. And we've had a lot of questions from viewers about one, you know, what is distribution going to look like for the series? Are we going to see this in school? Mm -hmm. I know that Dr. Rhonda has talked about implementing this mm -hmm. into her educational practices, but do we want to see this in other places? And, and within that, I mean, we have all this literature now that has contributed to this conversation. Um, you know, and, and some, some in ways better than others, people have brought up examples like Hamilton, which has been debated and unplugged and put back together a bunch of different times. Mm. Um, people have also brought up the history of white trash by Nancy Eisenberg. 13th by Ava DuVernay. And so, and so where do you see this going and fitting into that conversation as a literary device? I mean, it, it's part of the conversation, right? I mean, we hope to move the needle on the, on the civic conversation, but there's a, a lot of people fighting the fight. Um, and we're hoping we've done three episodes. We, our goal is to tell all the inflection points up to the present. Um, and we feel, you know, we can be a, an important part of that conversation. Yep. Yeah, I think um, for me, you know, one of my dreams, and I just want to put it out in the universe, I want to work with uh, Dr. Rhonda Taylor Bullock on a curriculum, you know, so that we can really, mm -hmm. you know, we can lead with the episode, but then we can dig a lot deeper mm -hmm. to see the ways in which uh, this history affects us in the present. And John mentioned, you know, the, the way we've mapped out the series over 15, 16 episodes is chronological and it's looking mm. at different moments and inflection points in American history. But then there's, then there's another possibility and conversation about, you know, Brother Cornelius, about that international piece. Mm. We know that race is bigger than the United States. The Portuguese were writing, you know, things about this prior to the, you know, the incident in Virginia. So, you know, and then there's and then there's all these global implications. So for me, you know, I just want to say it both as a as a as a prayer and as an affirmation that this work continues. Mm -hmm. History of white people in America, you know, uh, has so much opportunity. Even I don't know if I'm supposed to say this out loud, but I'm just going to say it. This is an exclusive announcement. But I mean, I even see this in graphic novel medium. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. in the same way that. Um, that uh, brother John Lewis's story, yes. you know, was told through March. We can we can use that medium, and this is coming from a from a nerd comic book video game loving kid. You know, that's a mm. medium that's accessible to me in the way that a text wasn't when I was mm -hmm. 16 years old. Right. You know, so I, I I can see this diversifying in so many different ways. No pun intended. Yeah. Yeah, and I will say like, because uh, you talked about even bringing it even more um, to present day, because one of the things that we realized in paying attention to over the years of working with young kids, they would always talk about back in the day, back in the day. Like this, this was across years, that was a common theme because kids would talk about racism as if it, will, if, as if it were, right? And so we had to be even more intentional about helping them to understand it was and it is. Mm -hmm. Right, still now, and bringing in Black Lives Matter movement, bringing in the school to prison pipeline, and talking about mm -hmm. needing to dismantle it with school resource officers and schools, and helping them to understand it. 
that you know racism is still existing here and in spaces where, where they're connected and so since you're speaking things out into existence peers i also want to add that we are we're working on a play-based anti-racism curriculum for pre-k mm. oh my and so i'm wondering like how can we and we want to center it around food can I? <laughs> Yeah, and so we want to sit around a food, bringing in also food justice and history of like land, yeah. right? And helping little kids um, understand and develop healthy racial identities while also understanding little kid, pre-K is not too young to learn about the history of white people, <laughs> okay? Because the, the, their biases are forming at much earlier age, much earlier ages than people think, mm -hmm. right? So we have to be a part of curating these spaces where we're helping kids develop healthy racial identities, teaching them truth and giving them access to language, visuals to help them make sense of this world that's around them. Mm. I love it. I volunteer. <laughs> I there volunteer. you go. I love the collaboration we're have, seeing happen in real time. This is mm. good. <laughs> and John, I've got to pick on you because we're going to teach the pets too. We're going to- I know, sorry uh, about that. My <laughs> My dog really wants to. Yo, and you got him to close okay. the door, and he came back and broke back in. Like, I know. Yeah, I know. and so he wants to learn about anti-racism too, racism too. So it's all good. <laughs> Sorry, guys. <laughs> well, everyone, we're gonna bring it on home. Um, but before we say goodbye to everyone, we have a special musical treat. And Pierce, would you please tell us more about that? Sure. So, um, you know, History of White People in America is, is a mix of animation and, and musical storytelling. And um, in the clip we're about to share with y'all, we go a little bit behind the scenes of what goes into the creative process that, that makes the music that kind of scores the series. And so here in this beautiful home that my dad designed with my mother and Alan Thompson on piano, uh, we are about to show you some clips that, that kind of gives you a glimpse to lift that fourth wall up and kind of shows you uh, what it, what it's looked and, and felt and smelled like uh, here mm. in the in the creative space sonically. So John, you ever you ever heard this yet? Nobody's heard this. This is a world premiere exclusive, uh -huh. and uh, I just want to say that the the vibration in the room when we were channeling the spirits of Sally Hemming and Eston Hemmings. It's, it was just incredibly powerful. So get your tissues ready and, uh, you know, put your headphones on so you can hear every nuance. Uh, and we are really proud to present this, uh, this live performance of History of White People in America. Peace, love, respect. My name is Pierce Freelon. I'm a co-director and composer of the animated series, History of White People in America. And today we're gonna to show you a little behind the scenes of what happens musically in the series. Check it out. In America in the early 1600s, you didn't exist. I hate to break it to you like this. Listen to what your history books missed. What would be made white were completely unrelated, undermelanated people. Frankenstein collaged by an optical illusion. The ultimate mirage called race, a social construction like Santa Claus. Back in the day, y'all either English or Scott, Irish Catholic or Protestant, land owning or not, but you can't have white without black in America. Back before we was Captain America, black wasn't a race. Africans came 
came from different nations, like in Dongo, where Queen Azinga reigned. Indigenous were the same. Pohatan, Doeg, regardless of tribe, melanin didn't determine fate. Skin color didn't make a difference, no matter what hue your flesh was tinted in. Cause your complexion wasn't kinship, and pigment was insignificant. It didn't prevent you from certain privileges. This is the story of how skin became color, color became race, and race became power. The creation of the Caucasian, white Aryan. It's the story of how white became American. All right. So that's a little sample from episode one. And now I'm going to invite some very special guests. to share some music from episode three, which is a conversation between Esten Hemmings and Sally Hemmings. These are the uh, son and the mother of, uh, all right, I'll just do that part over. Well, how would you describe Sally Hemmings? The, the reason that we are searching for words is that there is no word for an enslaved woman. Mm. who is impregnated by her master. That's why we're searching for a word. It's not concubine. It's not wife. Mm. It's not girlfriend. Mm -hmm. It's not even love. Mm. You should, you should no, no. You, we're keeping that. See? Breaking the fourth no, wall for a minute. Just, just because, you know, if there was a word like wife that could be applied, mm. we would use it. Right. Well, this is... Uh, the woman, Sally Hemings, who had a child with President Thomas Jefferson. And, uh, More than one child. And this is the eldest of the children, Esten Hemings, in dialogue with his mother, Sally Hemings, uh, after Thomas Jefferson has died. Mama, t tell me about m my father. Baby, 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 I'm mourning. Oh, 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 I'm mourning. My heart is breaking. Baby, read this. Notes on the State of Virginia by Thomas Jefferson. The first difference which strikes us is that of color. Whether the black of the skin proceeds from the color of the blood, the color of the bile, or from some other secretion, the difference is fixed in nature. And is this difference of no importance? Is it not the foundation of a greater or less share of beauty in the two races? Are not the expressions of every passion in the color of white preferable to the eternal monotony, that immovable veil of black which covers all the emotions of the other race. Superior beauty is thought worthy of attention in the propagation of our horses, dogs, and other domestic animals. Why not of that in man? It appears to me that in memory they are equal to whites, in reason they are much inferior, and in imagination they are dull, tasteless, and anomalous. They are at least as brave and more adventuresome, but this may proceed from want of forethought. We hold, we hold, we hold. 
they are more ardent after their female. Love with them seems to be more an eager desire than a tender, delicate mixture of sentiment and sensation. Their griefs are transient. They seem to require less sleep. This unfortunate difference of color and perhaps of faculty is a powerful obstacle to the emancipation of these people. We hold these truths, we hold these truths, we hold these truths, we hold these truths. Deep-rooted prejudices entertained by the whites, 10,000 recollections by the blacks of the injuries they have sustained new provocations will divide us and produce convulsions across this nation which will probably never end but in the extermination of one by the other we hold these truths to be self-evident that all Mama, read this. I tremble for my country when I reflect that God is just, that his justice cannot sleep forever. I tremble for my country when I reflect that God is just, that his justice cannot sleep forever. Ancestors are pleased. Thank you. Nina Freelon as Sally Hemings, Alan Thompson. Alan Thompson, yes, yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Pierce Freelon. Hey. Hey. Wow. Oh my goodness. I think everyone is is taking that in. That was absolutely beautiful. Nina Pierce, thank you. And Alan, thank you as well. Um, what an amazing end to this very beautiful conversation. I'm so blessed and thankful to have to be, been able to be here with all of you tonight. So thank you, Nina and Pierce Freeland. Thank you for your time, your words, your contributions. Cornelius Moore, thank you for your wisdom, for, for giving us so, such a great blueprint to build on, off of. Dr. Rhonda, Taylor Bullock, thank you so much for your contributions, for, for bringing all the black girl magic along with Nina and, and really helping us understand that this education is one that never ends. And John, thank you. I wanna thank you honestly for being an ally in this work and, and helping us you know, to, to extend this conversation to the people who really need to hear it. Um, and I want to thank everyone watching. You were just as much as part of this conversation with your great questions and 
it's 8 19 so we gotta go but the conversation does not have to end um i think you could find most if not all of our panelists online and keep the conversation going ask them your questions um you can also um you can also you know log on to um dworldchannel.org to to view all of the episodes in the series and see what else is coming um yeah and i want to thank the world channel crew as well for all of the work that they did behind the scenes you're great and again another i'm giving a round of applause i'm sure everyone else is clapping on the other end of their computers for everyone involved in tonight um and thank you thank you so much and thank please you. share keep the you're great host thank you thank you thank you very much all right, peace and blessings to everyone. Please take care of yourselves, stay safe, and vote. Vote. <laughs> Happy Indigenous Peoples Day. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Paris, yes. Yes, thank you, Cornelius, thank you. Okay, bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye.